Throughout this series, if you haven't been here, we, I have just been answering your questions. That's what we've been doing this entire series. A little different format than what we normally do. Normally, um, I just kind of preach on a topic or a passage of, of Scripture. Um, but this, we have just been taking your questions and answering them. And I'm just so um, appreciative of you guys submitting those questions. We keep getting questions every week. Um, I'm never going to be able to answer all of these up here. Um, so when the series is over, if, you're, if you submitted a question and it was not answered, I will write a little blog post on our website and you can read your answer there, okay? So I will get to your answer, maybe not up here, but eventually I will. But I just want to, I want to thank everybody who did submit questions. So let's just get right to it. Let's get to our first question, shall we? Um, what is our first question today? Here it is. How do I stop comparing my relationship with God to other people's? Um, great question. I love this question. Um, but this question, the root of this question isn't as much your relationship with God. I think a better question to ask here is, how do I stop comparing? Because that's really the issue here. Um, we all compare with, with certain topics. Um, for some of us, we compare our relationship with God to somebody else's, but for some of us, we compare our houses or our cars or um, our materials or our, our marriages or our parenting, our kids, to other people's who looks a little better. So um, I'm going to just wrestle with the question, how do you stop comparing, and I'm going to talk about it in a way that talks about relationship, because that's what it was, it was asked. But I'll give you four ways, pretty quickly, of how we stop comparing, okay? Because I think that's the crucial part. Number one, how do we stop comparing? Number one, remember that you are unique. Remember that you are unique. Who you are, why you are, why you do the things that you do, what you do, how you see the world, everything about you is unique to you. We, it's, there's, a, there's a bunch of different research that says how that happens. Um, it's First off, I believe that you are made with a purpose by a creator. And because of how he made you and because of what you grew up in, because of the morals that you had, because of what has happened in your life, because of all those things, it has formed who you are today. So I think the first thing to remember when you start comparing yourself to other people and comparing yourself to other people's um, faith, especially, is to remember that you are unique. And I'll give you an example for me. Um, some people love going outside into the wilderness, camping, just being part of nature. And when they are part of nature, they feel closer to God than ever. Some of you in the room would say, yeah, it's me. When, I'm, when I do like a nature walk or if I go hiking and I just see the sunset, I just feel closer to God. That is great. That is not me. Okay. I hate hiking. I don't like it. Um, one time when we were in California, my wife wanted to hike up to, what was that observatory that we went to? The Griffith. I don't know if you've ever been to California. It's a great view of Hollywood sign. And, uh, but we had a stroller. She said, we can hike. Um, there is a hiking trail you can go up, but there's a, there's a different hiking trail that you can take strollers. I said, okay, cool. That hiking trail was called The Road. There was no hiking trail. We were going up this mountain with no shoulders going up. And then at one point, as a joke, I said, huh, where are we going? There? Because it was so far away, there was no possible way it's where we're going. She went, yeah. And then 20 minutes later, I was like, oh, we are going there. See, that, I do not connect. That's not the way that I connect with God through nature and, and things like that. There are times where I will be just, something will happen in nature and, and it helps me. That's just not how I do it. That's not, I don't feel closer to God in nature. I think, where's the air conditioning is what I normally think, okay? Where, but some of you, that's how you are. That's not how I am. There's different ways that I feel closer to God. So you need to figure out who you are uniquely. And because you're unique, what you do to grow, grow, to grow closer to God is going to look different than what other people do. Psalms 139, 14 says this, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. See, for some of us, we compare because we don't understand who we actually are, and that's why we compare. So we're thinking, okay, I don't really know who I am. I see this person who I like, so maybe I just need to do what they do. You are unique, and you need to understand that. Um, and we're big fans here of like self-assessments and learning about yourself. Um, one big thing that a lot of us have done, and if you want more information, um, Frank who was up here, is the man to talk to. Um, and we've talked about it before, is the Enneagram. It's kind of a pretty trendy thing now. Um, but it has helped me and Frank and a lot of our staff figure out who we are. Um, we've done things like strength finders before. Um, so if you are still trying to figure that out, who you are, I would highly recommend look, looking up the Enneagram. And if you take that assessment, um, you can find a free one and you have no clue 
what that means, talk to Frank after when you come here one week, and he will break it all down for you. It's been really helpful for me, but I think it's important to know who you are. So number one, remember who you are. Number two, how do we stop comparing? You have to realize comparison is a trap. The idea of comparing to other people, it's a trap. It's something that a lot of us do, but it is a trap. Because here's why. You will never win, and you will never be satisfied when you keep comparing. You'll never win and never be satisfied because there will always be somebody with a little bit better than you. You might have the nicest car, but you will eventually find somebody that has a nicer car. You may have a great house, but you will eventually find somebody that has a better house. And you may have a great faith and a great relationship with God, but you may find people that it seems like they have a better faith than you do. So comparing, it's a trap. And a lot of this comes to play when it comes to social media. I'm telling you, if you, this is a problem with you, I would say get off social media. Because here's what social media does. Everybody posts their highlights. So a lot of times, if we're in a fight with, with our spouse, let's say, and we look like, man, they seem really happy. I wish I was as happy as they are. Most likely, they were not happy because the wife is making the husband taking that picture, and they don't even want to do it, and they're forced to take this picture. They might not even be happy. You have no idea. But because of social media, we perceive that everyone's life is perfect because we're seeing their highlight reel. We're not seeing behind the scenes. So comparison, it's a trap. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And when we are so focused on other people's relationships, we're seeing what they are, want us to see, those highlights, but we need to focus on ourselves. So comparison, it's a trap. Number three, compliment instead of compare. And this is hard, but when you find yourself in that trap where you constantly are comparing yourself to other people, instead of comparing, try complimenting. Figure out a way you can compliment. And I'm going to be honest. My first reaction when someone does something better than me, I'm very, very competitive, is to compare and complain. That's my first. I'll give you an example. Um, I would like to work out more. Um, I don't work out basically ever, and I would like to work out more. And here's my excuse. When I see people that work out all the time, here's what I tell myself. I say, well, they are able to work out because they don't have three kids. They're able to work out because their job is more flexible than mine. You know what? I'm a better parent than they are because I don't sacrifice my parenting time. Instead, I would rather say, you know why I do that? Because I'm lazy. That's why I do that. I don't want to get up early, so I make excuses for myself and say, I mean, I could get up at six o'clock and go to the gym like other people do, right? So instead of comparing, what we should be doing is complimenting. How can we compliment them? You know what? You see someone that's doing something and your natural reaction is to be jealous of them. What if we start complimenting and say, you know what? what? Instead of comparing, we compliment. Instead of saying, hey, man, I wish I could do what they do. Instead of saying that, why don't you meet with them and say, hey, you're really good at that. How are you so good at that? It changes everything. Comparing, it's a trap. And then the last one, number four, focus on God's opinion. Focus on on God's opinion. And this is so easy to say and so hard to live, right? Focus on God's opinion. Focusing on what other people's opinions are of you, even though it's hard not to do, it's a waste of time. And you know that. I know that. It's a waste of time and it's a waste of energy. And at the end of the day, you will never feel satisfied because of what other people think of you. Instead, you're actually going to feel empty, feel like you're never enough and you're never going to make it to that level. So instead of comparing to what other people are doing and comparing to somebody else's relationship with God that you don't actually know what it is because you don't see behind the scenes, instead of doing that, remember that other people's opinions of you are not what you're seeking. You're seeking and focusing on what God thinks of you. Matthew chapter 10, 20 to 31 is what Matthew says. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. See, Jesus says, I know everything and I care about the sparrows. So how much do I care about you? When we stop focusing on what other people think of us, instead focus on the God of the universe and what he says about us, what we know, we start to realize that we are loved no matter what we do. 
that we are not our past, we're not defined by it, that we are not our failures, that we have a unique purpose, and that we are worth dying for, Jesus said, even with all the flaws, even with all of our mistakes. So rely on God's opinion rather than comparing your faith to others, because you are unique, you are made different than everybody else, and the way your faith is going to look differently than everybody else. So what I would recommend for anyone in this room that says, I have trouble comparing myself, if there's somebody that you see that you look up to in their faith, I would um, go talk to them. Be like, hey, I would like to know what you do. Compliment instead of compare. And then remember, at the end of the day, it's not about what everyone else says about you. It's about what God says about you, because you are unique, and comparison is a trap. So that's my answer for that one. Next question. Have you ever gone through a crisis of faith or deconstruction? Has your theology changed at all in the last few years? If so, how? Um, I love this question. I definitely want to answer this question. Um, Deconstruction, that's um, kind of a popular, trendy word. Some of you may have have heard it, like deconstructing your faith. Um, And at the root of it, it means to pull apart your faith to understand why you have your faith. Um, And I think that deconstruction can be a good thing. But for a lot of people, it's used as, as an excuse to believe whatever they want to believe, even though the Bible doesn't say that. Um, so a lot of people say, well, I deconstructed my faith, and now I have this whole other belief that's easier for me to believe in this culture. Um, so there is some worry, of course, on everything. But um, when it comes to me, since this is personally asking me, and the next question we're going to answer is going to cover this a little bit, um, I for sure have. I've gone through crisis of faith, I've gone through deconstruction, and I've gone through um, lots of doubts and struggles. Um, when I was in high school, into college, um, I really started to question everything that I believed. I grew up in a Christian home, I, I knew all the stories, and then high school, college, I started to come to the realization that um, if my parents were something different, then I would believe something different. So my parents were any other religious belief, that's what I would have been at that time. And I thought that's a terrible reason for me to be a Christian is solely because my parents, what if they're wrong? And now I'm stuck in this faith forever. So um, I started really challenging myself and, and started to figure out what I was going to do. And then through the, the years, I have felt like I've constantly been doing this. And here's what I've done. And here's what I would recommend for you if this is something you're going through. And we're going to cover this a lot in the next question. But um, what I ended up doing is I took my house of faith, of morals, of everything that I had been taught, and I tore it down to the foundation. And my foundation was Jesus. That was my foundation. No matter, no, I got to a point where I was like, you know what, I know that Jesus is who he says he is. I know that he came and he proved that he loved us and he proved he was the son of God by dying on a cross and then coming back to life three days later. I know that. I believe that through history. I believe that through, through what other people reported. I just believe that there's a God and Jesus came. So that was my foundation. And then I started to rebuild my house. And over the years, I have taken other walls down. I've repainted the house. I have changed the windows. But my foundation's always been the same. So there hasn't been any major, like, theological things that, that I have been challenged. I have uh, found myself, instead of changing theology, um, more understanding why I believe it. That's what I found recently. Um, I would question it, and then I would figure out the answer, and then be like, oh, I actually only know this answer because that's what I was taught. I don't actually know the answer. So um, that's something I've been doing and that I think it's important and crucial for you guys to do. And this will actually lead to our next question. So let's go to our next question. Um, Does doubting God make me a bad Christian? Because that's kind of where some of this comes from, right? Is that we have those doubts. Um, And this is a loaded question. I understand that. Does doubting God make me a bad Christian? The first thing I want to say about this question is this. I hate that word bad Christian. I hate that word. I think we should take it out, okay? Because I don't believe there are good Christians and bad Christians. I believe that as followers of Jesus, we believe that no matter what we've done, we are forgiven. We don't have to be good because there is no good. That good is relative. We talked about that last week. That we don't have to be good, that all we need to be is forgiven, and we follow Jesus because of it. So I don't really like that word, but, but I know what this question is asking. This question is asking, If I doubt, am I sinning, is basically what it's asking. Am I dishonoring God by doubting? And that's a good question that I think we should all wrestle with. And and just so you know, for me to be up front, I have doubted. I have doubted my faith. I have doubted the existence of a God. I've I've doubted Bible. I've doubted salvation. I've doubted it all. I've done it. So my answer to this question would be uh, yes and no. So is doubting sin or is doubting, dishonoring God? Yes and no. 
This, so let me explain it. So I truly believe it is okay to doubt. It is fully okay to doubt. It's okay to wrestle with those doubts because that's human nature. That's who we are. It's natural. That's what happens to a lot of us. We all, when we, when we dive deeper in faith, doubts are, are going to come. Questions are going to come. There's nothing wrong with that. Where I think we start to fall into a bad area is when we just stick with our doubt and say, well, this is my life now. I'm just always going to doubt for the rest of my life. I'm just content with doubt. That's when I think that we start to go into a bad area. I'm going to cover a lot of that. But James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 says this, um, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Let me be honest with you when it comes to my self-doubting, and this is just me. I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad by saying this. This is just me. I find that the times that I doubt the most, personally, when I have the most doubts, is when I'm not connecting with God on a regular basis, when I'm not praying, when I'm not reading Scripture. For me, I'm not saying that's you, but for me, when all those questions come, I start to think, oh, I haven't spent time with God in weeks. Oh, I've, I come to church, but I'm not really listening. Oh, I, and I start to be, oh, I'm literally disconnected from the God of the universe. So when you have doubts that you have not worked through yet, when you have those doubts, which we all do, um, the danger is that I, what I've seen is that we become proud of them. Hey, I got my doubts, and I'm proud of it. Look, this is, this is my faith now. And when you are proud of your doubts, I'm saying this with as much love as I can, you have a weak faith. That's what James says. When you're proud of them, say, well, this is, this is my faith. Some of us, we have those doubts, and we don't want to have them, and we're wrestling with them, and we're not proud of it. We're struggling through them. I get it. I'm not talking about you, but I have seen so many people that say, yep, I have my doubts. That's, this is going to be, I'm content with my doubts, and I don't think that's honoring to God. I don't think James wants us to have those doubts. I don't, want, I don't think the God of the universe wants us to be content with doubt. See, doubting doesn't harm your faith, but being content with doubt does. That's the difference. Doubting does not harm your faith. We all go through it, and, we should, and when we do, we should work through it and struggle through it and talk to people and figure that out. But when we say, well, this is just my faith, then that does harm your faith. When we stay in our doubt with God and we are content with it and we're fine with it, say, you know what, I'm, this is my life now, what we are saying is that we are suspicious of who God says he is and we don't trust that what he says he is. And when you don't trust someone's word, you know what they're, you're calling them? A liar. When we're content with our doubt, not just when we have doubts, we all have them. When we're content with them, that's what we are saying to the God of the universe. Let me give you an analogy. Um, let's say you are a boss at a job and you have an employee that comes up to you and um, they've been working there for a little while and they show up to, to you, the boss, and they say, hey, I just wanted to clarify a couple things. I just have a couple questions on how some of these things work. I just like to wrestle these questions. And this person asks the question to you, the boss. And you answer the questions, and they go, okay, great. I got my answers. I'm good to go. Thanks a lot. As the boss, you're not going to be mad at that employee, right? You're like, no, the, that employee actually cares about this job. They actually care about wanting to be good at this. They had some questions. They had some doubts about stuff that came to me. But let's say you have another employee who has a ton of questions. But instead of ever going to, the, to you, the boss, they just tell everybody else about all their questions. So yeah, I don't know if the, we should, we should, any of us should work here because I have all these questions. Like, well, have you gone to the, No, no, I'm not going to talk to them about it because I don't even know if I even believe that person. So I'm not going to ask anybody else. To you, if you're that, that boss and you say, and you let that person know that has those questions, hey, you're invited whenever you want. Come in my office. My doors are wide open. I would love to hear your questions. And that person keeps going, no, no, no. I don't need to ask you the questions because you're the one that I'm not sure about. I don't need to ask you any of those questions. What would you do as a boss? You'd be like, that employee doesn't care about this stuff. If you have your questions and your doubts, which we all do, take them to him. That's what we should do. Instead of what I've seen most of us do is say, I have doubts. I'm never going to spend time with God. I'm never going to go to church because I'm never going to wrestle with those questions. I'm never even going to ask him about it. I'm just going to stay with these doubts. That is not what we should be doing. Being content with doubts is the highest form of contempt we can muster for God. It's true. So what do we do when these doubts come in? Um, there's a great story in Mark chapter 9 that I think 
really shows, and it's been what I've wrestled with for a long time with these doubts, of what we should do when we have these doubts and these questions. Um, there's a man who has uh, a kid who's sick, and he goes to Jesus, and first, well, first he goes to the disciples and tries to get the disciples to heal um, one of his kids that are sick, and they can't do it. So he goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want you to, to heal my, my son. Um, and here's what Jesus says to him. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I think that is a great statement for us. God, I believe, help my unbelief. God, I want to believe, but I have these doubts. Help my unbelief. That is when I have, these, when I have doubts and I go through that, those things, that's what I say. God, I believe, but I need you to help me because right now I don't believe. I believe, help my unbelief. Do not be content with your doubts. If you have them, talk to somebody and take them to the God of the universe. That's what you wrestle with those doubts. Don't say, well, this is my life now. Do not be content with them. God knows your heart. He knows your heart. So take your struggles and your doubts to him. And then the last question we're going to talk about today is this. Um, I struggle with commitment and belongingness, how to combine, choose what to believe. Is it all as simple as loving and following Christ? Who determines how we follow Christ? Um, first, I would like to say to the person who wrote this question is, I am so glad that you are here. Assuming you're here. I actually don't know if you're here, you but I'm so glad that you are here to submit this question, that you decided this is a place that you can trust enough and feel open enough to ask this question. So I want to commend you. If this is something you've been struggling with, you're here, and I am so happy that you're here. Um, so is it as simple as loving and following Jesus Christ? Um, it is as simple as that. But for any of you that have been a follower of Jesus long enough, you know that loving and following Jesus is not simple. It is as simple as loving and following Jesus. That's what it means to be a Jesus follower. But man, following Jesus is not simple, is it? It is not simple. And the reason why it's not simple is because Jesus asks us to do things that is against our own selfish desires. It's against everything that we have inside of us. So following Jesus and what he says to do, that's the answer, but that's not simple. In fact, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, listen to what, what Jesus says here. And he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Hey, you want to follow me? Here's what it's going to take. Deny yourself. Pick up the cross and follow me because that's where I'm going. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Um, that, that idea of taking up your cross, um, some people take that as like pick up your burden. That's not what it means. When Jesus says, says, take up your cross, back then, the cross was a torturous execution device. So Jesus says, when you take up your cross, you're taking up that knowing that is going to your death. That's what I'm doing. So if you want to follow me, that's what it's going to take. Simply deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So what does that even mean, going, taking our cross and walking to our death? Here's what it simply means. That you don't live for you anymore. You live for something else. Is that easy to do? No. In fact, we all will be wrestling with that tension for the rest of our lives. But Jesus says, if you want to follow me, what it means is you don't live for you anymore. You live for something else. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. That's what he's calling us to do. Dying to yourself, which means absolute and full surrender. Fully surrendering to him. And this is hard for a lot of us to do. And I blame the church for a lot of this. Because I've been in a lot of churches. And the church has done a very good job of focusing on the organization of church to build that up as big as it possibly can be. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to preach a little watered-down message in order for people to actually want to come in. See, um, Jesus, when in Scripture, in the Gospels, when there was a big crowd around Jesus, Jesus never celebrated. He got suspicious. He said, they must not understand what I'm saying. 
I'm going to preach the hardest message I've ever preached, and they'll all leave. That's what he did. In fact, um, I was looking at this uh, a little while ago, but the Barna Group says that even though Christianity is on a decline in America, still three-fourths of Americans still confess to being a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian in their religion. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that three-fourths of Americans are actually following Jesus, denying themselves, taking up their cross, and following him? No. Of course not, right? There's no way. And that's because I think the church at times has done a very good job of make growing as big of church as we possibly can do so that we can feed the organization and doing a terrible job of telling people what following Jesus actually means. I think it's on us. That's why I really think it is. See, my fear is that some of us are following Jesus because we want to go to heaven, but we're not willing to follow what he actually says we need to do, which is deny yourself, which is surrender everything to him. That's what it means. Mark chapter 8, verse 35 says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Jesus talking. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Hey, if your goal is to save your life and make it as good as possible, you're going to lose it. But if you decide, you know what, I'm going to surrender my will and my desires to you, and if you say this is what we're going to do, this is the way I'm going, if you say that we need to go this direction, I'm going that way. If you say I need to give up this, I'm going to give it up because I'm following you. It's not about me anymore. It's all about you. When you decide I'm going to lose my life for the gospel, you save it. So what I want to do, and, I'm going to, and we're going to get ready to close here, and the worship team's going to play a closing song for us. What I think that we should be focusing on, if you're in the room and you would say, I'm a, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus, I want to follow Jesus closer. Is it that simple? I, here's what I want to say to you, okay? I want to say that what we should be doing taking everything we have in our life and just putting it on the table. There it is. Not a lot, but God, whatever you want, it's yours. Whatever you need, that's, this is what I got. So if this is what you want, I'm giving it all to you. And it's hard. It's hard to do, right? That is a hard thing, and that's something that we are going to constantly wrestle and struggle with. Remember, we have salvation not because we do these things, not because we're good enough, but because solely because God saved us. We don't do these things to earn salvation. We do these things because he loved us and saved us. That's why we do these things. So we say, God, you know what? What you can do with all my stuff is a lot better than what I can do with my stuff. Just put it on the table. The idea of fully surrendering to the God of the universe it is a one-time decision, and it's a daily decision. It is a thing that you go, you know what? Today, I am deciding that even though I don't even know what it looks like, even though I don't know how I'm going to do it, I'm giving it all up. And then every day saying, God, remind me. I need to keep doing this. It's not just giving your mornings to God. You know, I'm going to give a half hour to God. It's giving your mornings to God and then giving Him the entire day as you go to do your work, as you connect with your friends, as you hang out with your family. It's giving Him your morning and your entire day. It's complete surrender. It's not just serving. Not just coming here on a Sunday morning if you serve here or going to our community events or whatever way you serve. It's not just serving twice a month. It's serving twice a month and then living a heart of servant, of, of always serving of servitude, an attitude of service to other people. It's finding ways to constantly do it and always have that heart. That's what it is. It's not just about giving 10%. It's about giving 10% and living a life of generosity. That everything I have, I need to be responsible, but I'm generous because the God of the universe is generous to me. This thought of surrendering, fully surrendering, put it all on the table it's a hard decision but it starts with a one time decision some of you, you've made that decision to accept Jesus to your life but you've never made the decision to surrender your life to him because you're all for the heaven but the thought of actually giving up your life to him maybe some of the things maybe the easy things but I don't know about this like, here, God, I'll put like five of the things on the table. I'm going to keep the rest back here. That's not what he calls us to do. God calls us to take up your cross and follow me. Is it that simple? It's that simple. It's the, most, it's the hardest thing you will do. But for some of us, we need to make that decision today. It's a one-time decision we need to make right now. 
And then after we make the decision today, we have to make that decision tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. Not so that we earn salvation, but because he loved us so much that he sent his son for us. He says, if you want to follow me, it's what it's going to take. Put it on the table. And watch what I do with what you put on the table. Watch what I do with it. It might be hard at first. And you might be putting some things and you might be like forcing yourself to put your hand back. But I'm telling you, when you fully surrender, what he can do with your life is so much better than what we can do with our own lives. So I want to invite us to bow our heads and pray to the God who asked us to follow him. Who didn't make us take the first step, but took the first step for us. Let's pray.